Welcome, Carl, to Metalarian Pages. It's a great pleasure to talk with you about this new album, The Underworld Await Us All, and Niall and Martin's relating to the metal war in general. So we we'll start by asking, so how are you? How has the band been during the last couple of years? Well, we're doing okay. <laughs> we're very happy to have a new record coming out. We got some upcoming touring we're going to be doing, so we're pretty happy. Mm, okay, okay. So let's start talking about the new album. When do you when do you start working on this? The underworld awaits us all. Well, we're already finished. <laughs> oh, no, when 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 did you work? When do you start? Oh, working? when did we start? Yeah. You said when do you start? Ah, okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> when sorry, sorry. did we start? Past tense. Uh, I think we started back in twenty one or twenty two. Yeah, it's, we've been working on it for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now this The Underworld Awaits Us All came from a difference, but a long period, that is one of the first times, because usually Nile present albums consistently. And your last album, Vile Neolotic Right, was released in 2019, and we have this new album. So what are the reasons, what are the reasons this album delay a little compared to the previous ones? Well, a lot happened in the world. We had a, a worldwide pandemic, which pretty much threw everybody's musical undertakings into chaos. Uh, our drummer lives in Athens, Greece. Mm. So, you know, even though we do a lot of things online, you know, nowadays, there's still some things that you have to do together in person. Um, so, you know, that kind of delayed things. And two of the guys, uh, in the band, uh, had children. They spent their, uh, pandemic making babies. <laughs> <laughs> well, George and I were making metal. Uh, so then we had to replace some members. We had touring commencements we had to do and, there was just a lot of things that got in the way of, you know, trying to get this record finished. Mm, okay. So I, always, I'm very fan from fans since the, from Nile since the beginning. So for me, you are, for me, you are working always in any music. So that's why, do you prefer to focus it, uh, to focus on when you finish touring or when, how, or how do you decide when it's time to turn to, to work in a new songs and a new album? But we don't uh, try to write songs while we're on tour. Um, now songs aren't going to get written that way. There are some bands that can write on tour, but I don't think the kind of music that we play lends itself to that sort of thing. I, I think it needs focus and a singularity of purpose. So usually we start working on a record when we feel like it's time to work on the record like unless we like have that mindset we don't touch it we leave it alone all right because uh, i think for nile records it, it demands a focus a clarity of intent hmm okay okay so Nile is all Nile is always a band that pushes its boundaries and presents renewed sound in each album, especially for the new one. So how does the band push its sounds and at the same time not lose the, your essence since the beginning? So do you think it's a quiet job or it's a very difficult job perhaps to keep pushing your sounds and at the same time not lose your essence? Well, that is the, the difficult balance. A lot of artists face this same dilemma you know how do you remain true to yourself and your ideas and your fans yet at the same time you know, move forward and do some new things right how does one achieve that balance and that's an always evolving question there's no single simple answer to it i wish there were one um for us you know, we play from the heart and the mind and the soul. So we try to just stick to that and let that be the guiding sort of force. 
Okay, okay. So many bands and musicians see each album, or each each album as a child. Each one is special in its own way. It's a bit of cliche to say that each album is new release is the band's best. So, but do you consider this new album is your best work to date? And if so, what are the reasons that this make this album your best work to date? Well, you said it right there. Everybody always believes that the newest thing they did is the best thing they did. And that's the natural way of things. If if you didn't believe that, there's no way you would go through all the heartache and trouble and work that it takes to make a record like this, unless you believed in it. So I have to believe. You have to believe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 So a detail that it always mix in the compositions are the numbers. What it means, so I mean, so when you mix, you do mix the feeling with the numbers. And your kind of music is very technical, is very brutal, is very complex in many ways. So how do you see the line of the mix, the feelings with the numbers, with the maths? So do you think the music is more mathematical or is more feeling, especially in your kind of music that is very complex? I love what you're saying here. Um, oftentimes, I, I can hear when people are playing by the numbers and doing the math and not playing from the soul. So how does one take highly technical mathematical things and play them with conviction and soul and feeling? For us... <laughs> We play the songs enough to where we don't have to think about them anymore, to where we don't have to count them. <laughs> we don't have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right, because if your brain is doing that, then you're not playing from the heart. So for us, we play it until. We don't have to think, we're just doing it. And at that point, you can start putting your your soul into it because you're not counting anymore. So that's for us the answer. Do it a lot and then you have to think about it anymore. Mm, okay, and related to this question, you raised the bar from a technical level on an, a from a technical level on guitar and drums. Because your scholar is one, I think, one of the best drum metal drummers around the world since, well, since the death metal was created at the mid of the 90s, of the mid 80s. So how do you see now these concepts of technical, brutal, progressive, or the, a lot of labels that the death metal has nowadays? Do you think it's correct to say Nile is a technical, brutal death metal? Well, knowing that the Nile is always, uh, always be an better technical band sings your first album i don't think of us as a technical band when mm -hmm. someone says we're technical i think of arch spire mm -hmm. that's technical mm -hmm. amazing amazing technical metal right but i don't think of us like that i think of us more like a metal band <laughs> Right now, I don't think uh, this is technical, because as soon as I, I hear the word technical, that's not everything that Nile is. That's only a small part of what we do. Um, so I don't, I don't even think of this like a technical death metal band, which is probably stupid because that's what we are. But I don't think of us like that. I hear a lot of other stuff in there. I hear, you know, violence and savagery and... Uh, a lot of feeling, a lot of humanity. Um, that's what I hear when I put it on. I don't hear the technicality. Because to me, this is the shit that I play every fucking day. Mm -hmm. I'm working on technical things. That's just part of being a guitar player playing this kind of music. You have to practice a lot. Mm -hmm. So I don't think about it like that. I think about when we're actually playing the music. It's just the music and we're bringing it to life okay okay well okay but that is true that is true 
So talking about one detail that captured my attention in this new album is especially for the name of one song, the chapter of the being hung, up, hung upside down. Well, you know, the, the name is weird. No, go ahead and say it. This is the <laughs> best part of my day when people say this title. So please uh, be down. my guest. Yeah, well, we're chapter go ahead. Of the Shot for not being hung upside down and stuck in the underworld on made to eat feces by the four apes. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and the curious thing for me, this is, this is the, the third time that Nile used a song with a long title because the first time was in Annihilation of the Wicked with chapter of the obscenes before giving bread to inner wand of the present of the crescent shaping our horns. And the second time it was Papyrus. And now there is the third time that you use a long time in a title. So for you, for me, this is a curious thing, a very craft as a, as a fan. So what do you, what do you, what do you, what are the reasons that you use for the third time a long name in a title and a song? Usually these long titles are related to the actual title in the ancient text. Like all these came from the Book of the Dead. Mm -hmm. So that's what the titles are like for a lot of the chapters in the Book of the Dead. Highly specific titles, right? But for me, it's a lot of metal fun, right? It's it's fun, right? What's saying that title, hearing the fans uh, scream it out when they want to hear that song at the metal show, that's fun. I love it. I also love it when people have to write it out in interviews or the record label has to write it on all their promo stuff and they have to type it all out. Or, you know, for me, it's fun. I mm. like it. I enjoy it. And you really couldn't call that song, Chapter for Not Being Hung Upside Down on Steak and on World to Made to Eat Feces by the Four Apes, you couldn't call that something else. If you tried to call that chapter, it's not the same thing. It just wouldn't have the same magic. Uh, okay, okay. Well, talking about other kind of topics, especially for this new album, and obviously from the transitions that you have for this new album to the previous one for this new one. Perhaps your previous album, Bile Nihilotic Rights, was released by Nuclear Blast, and now you are one of the biggest labels also, Naples Records. So what did you decide to leave Nuclear Blast and enter Naples Records? Because I spoke with a lot of musicians around the world saying that the reason was the nuclear blast sell by the sony music they're, they're they change the the things in the contracts a lot of things and for you what are the reasons they change for nuclear blast in label records well you know i i can't speak for everybody else uh nor do i want to speak ill of nuclear blast uh i thought they treated us reasonably well they they were great to work with, uh, but our contract was up. It was time to go somewhere else. We uh, wanted to give Napalm a try. Okay, and we are speaking about the concept lyrically and visually for this new album. I re this album remembers me the the reason that when you spoke at the gates of Situ, lyrically when you talk uh, when you when we when you talk about the ancient cultures in Egypt and ancient Egypt, and now I tr I, I try to see some lyrics for this aspect, and I try to relate this underworld at weights also with the ancient ancient Egypt cultures in there. So is this new album are related perhaps like a second part of at the gates of Situ? Or perhaps it's a, a new chapter in, in the... It's a new chapter. <laughs> it's a new chapter. It is not a part two. This is the underworld awaits us all. It's its own unique creature, its own entity. It's its, its own thing. It's not anything else. It doesn't sound like any other Nile record, but it is a Nile record. Hmm. Okay. 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 Interesting to know. So you've been around for uh, all, yeah, more than 30 years in, in, in here in the world with Nile, especially because Nile was created in 1993. And one topic that I want to ask you personally right now is why do you, why do you delay 
five years to release your first album, Amos to Catacombs of Neferenka, because here in Latin America, it's very usual that a band from the 90s or 80s delay 10 years or 20 years to release an al their first album. But from US on Europe, always the band are continue releasing albums since the, since the first year, since the second year. So for you, what are the reasons that the band Nile delayed five years to release Amongst the Catacombs of Never Cup, great album, by the way. Well, that album didn't get written until, you know, 96 and 97. So uh, that's why it took so long. <laughs> so, some of the songs, uh, like Ramsey's Springer of War, that was, I think, uh, that was on an early demo called Ramsey's Springer of War. Um, but there was an evolution uh, from you know when we started as a group together and as we found our place, figured out what it was we were going to do. It took a while. It was not birthed in a single day. Nile was not built in a day. There we go, like Rome. It wasn't built in one day. It took a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is true because I remember the first demo from 1994 because I'm from the 80s. So I hear your I hear your band from 1996. Remember the first demo, right? I here in my country. So I remember very well. But he, at that time, you have an approach from more that metal, more classic that metal, more trashy. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time, Ramses is very different way to understand Nile. It's very different approach. It's very different yeah. approach. And Amons. And for me, one thing that captured my attention since the beginning that Nile has is the approach that you have in the drums because always the drums on Nile are, are very important or, or more important than all instruments in the in the music because you, you always try to reach a person that achieve many sounds many bass bleeds many techniques so there is very so to to replace your scholars now in Nile for me is a very difficult job for any kind of <laughs> I wouldn't do it <laughs> if the day comes when you know, George doesn't want to play Nile anymore, then I think we're done. I don't want to find another drummer. Uh, that will oh. that will be it. Uh, when oh. that day comes, if, if either George or I leave, probably uh, we're done. Uh, but we're happy right now, so I'm not worried about it. Okay. We've always had great drummers in yes. Nile, all the way back. Um, my best friend, uh, Peter Mora, Nile's original drummer, we played together for 10 years before Nile. And I really like playing with good drummers. <laughs> you know, uh, playing with a shitty drummer, I won't do it. I, I refuse. They got to be killer because it's very easy to ruin a song with a shitty drummer you lose the feel, you lose the groove, the the intent. I believe the the primal savage connection of rhythm. Guitar playing has rhythm. Vocals have rhythm. Drums have rhythm. And they should all lock together to be part of the same rhythm. Like it should all be coming from the same brain, riding the same wave together that's what makes music to me like bands that can play together no, no matter what it is they're playing if they've got good time together mm -hmm. that's what makes great shit like Crisian. i very rarely talk about other bands when i do now interviews but the band Crisian are magic because they are all on the same wavelength together when they play it's like almost super spiritual because it's three guys, but their souls are connected and they're all in that same rhythm together. Man, that's powerful stuff. Well, yeah, that Christian. Oh, I, I remember that you also say that Christian is a great band for you. Since I, I read a lot of interviews for you, and you say that Christian is a great band for you. Because so, they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they yeah. are. And man, this is an example. If anybody is wondering, oh, you know, 
who knows how to do death metal right? Who should I be listening to? Well, top of that answer is a band like Crisian or Immolation or, you know, any number of classic greats for good reason. These guys are the real thing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that is true. That is true. Well, talking about now the, from the light up from the whole history of Night House, you also will be, you also has a lot of change, especially in the bass and the bass players. The bass players always, I think, in each album you change new bass, new bass players. I don't know, I don't know why the reasons, but usually you stay with the same guitar, with the same drums in in, in a lot of albums. But the bass players always change in the career of. Nile, so what what are what is kind of things happen since the beginning? The bass player is not good enough for you. Who knows? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I want to use those words, uh, <laughs> but there have been a lot of people that tried to play bass in this band and failed. Um, there have been a few who did a good job but it's not an easy job and there's no reward for it no one is ever going to give somebody a grammy for playing bass in a nile context so there's little reward <laughs> so <laughs> i feel very lucky that we now have uh dan vadem vaughn uh playing bass with us the incredible bass player He also plays guitar and Morbid Angel, but as a bassist, man, this guy is, man, he delivers. He's got really good stuff. You can hear it on the record. Like one of the things with Nile Records in the past, it was really tough to hear the record because usually the guitar player was playing the bass. But on this record, you can hear the bass because Dan had his own ideas about bass parts and he did a fabulous job. So. Right now, we're fucking happy. Whatever happened with bass players in the past, I'm going to try to forget about it and not worry about it because right now we're happy. We got a good guy. Well, yeah, that is true. So now, since a long, long, long time, Nile has five members, two guitars, two, one bass, one vocalist. So that's well, that's a huge, huge thing in the career because usually Nile, it was Dallas, you and George, Dallas, you and most mostly of the albums are you and Dallas. And since the beginning, Nile was three, not Nile, well, were three, three members. And now for the first time in a long time, the band are five members. So how would you change? What would change in your mind to, re, to, to be a five members now? Well, we're not really five members. We're still four guys on tour because Brian doesn't tour. Uh, after his third child was born, no more touring for Brian. <laughs> But Brian wrote songs on the record. He played guitar on the record. He did vocals on the record. He's very much a part of this record. So for all the pictures that you know we did for promoting the album, well, Brian's on the record. So Brian's in the picture. That's why Brian is in the video. Because, well, you know, Brian is a part of this record. But live now is four people mm. so okay okay i understood i understood now now returning to the underworld awaits us all and its promotion plan so what are promotion plans you have for this album perhaps more tours more more concert mm. more video releaser videos who knows or perhaps you're already working a new album in secret by your solo, <laughs> solo project who knows no we're not working on anything in secret we had our hands full Uh, we got shitloads of touring coming up. We're going to Europe in September, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Singapore, blah, 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 in October. In January and February, we got a big tour in the States with Six Foot Under. Um, and that's just getting started. We got the whole rest of the world that we're going to try to get in on this touring cycle. So we're going to be busy. Okay. Okay. As I mentioned in the beginning, talking in the first question and talking about other kind of topics, and we are close. We are close to finish this interview, uh, Carl. And talking about a topic that changed the perspective of understanding the metal worldwide, it is the social networks. As you know, 
Today, thanks to this media, metal became more understandable and comprehensible in many ways, and even lost the sense of impact, fear, of mystery that it had during the 70s, 80s, or 90s. When you talk about the brujeria, I was there, I remember very well, and you believe that they were narco-satanic people. I remember very well all publicity about that band, or when you're talking about King Diamond, that was thinking uh, that was, he lived in a castle with monsters, demons, vampires in their, in their castle, or Bruce Dickinson writing lyrics to only bother conservative people, or the satanic black metal to just burn in churches, to piss up someone, these kind of topics, etc. Et et a lot of stuff happened during this during these eras in 70s, 80s, and 90s. So now there is no mystery or curiosity that metal gave you on a general level. What's your point of view uh, about this move away from the fear, mystery, or curiosity that the metal had before, and now everything is, is more comprehensible? Well, I think you said that very well. We have done away with the idea of mystery and now anybody that you want to see uh, that plays metal, you can see them on your YouTube or on social media or easily available on the internet. Uh, so a lot of the mystery is gone. That's one side of it. On the other side, if you're a young player, you now have access to see every band doing their thing. Like when I was a young player and I was curious about what the fuck was Steve Vai doing? You, there's no way you had to, you know, find a way to go see him in concert. But nowadays, if you're curious about how Steve Vai plays something, all you got to do is type in Steve Vai to Google and you will see 500 videos of Steve Vai doing his thing or whoever you care to watch. So in a way, I think, you know, the access that we now have is unprecedented. And I think it's accelerated the evolution of the art form. There's bands doing stuff just coming out today that's mind blowing and you can see all of it at the fucking touch of a mouse button. Mm. Okay, okay. And one of the last questions for this interview. Nergal comment that a new the Ner, that new musician have limited opportunities to to reach the, the popularity in the music industry because there is a tremendous demand for musicians, albums, Spotify do a, a little faster for the music. And also right now, the last the last comment, the last comments from Jack Gibson from Exodus say that the music industry is completely dead because there is a lot of productions. Spotify kill the creativity, mm -hmm. creativity of the musicians. All, also, Danny Phil said the same. The Spotify is the cancer of for the artists because they don't they don't help the artists, they help them. They know the artist. So in this case, Spotify kind of is helping Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. As for you, what is your point of view now about the future in general for the music industry, for the metal scene? And well, the extreme metal, it's a great, it's, it's a, it's, right now it's a good place because people like me are still buying t shirts, CDs, this kind of stuff. But the music in general is very different. Well, you said that all very well. Um, thankfully, there are fans that support extreme metal um, that are willing to go to the show, buy a t-shirt, buy a CD. This is what keeps it alive. Right there. That's what matters. Music on a big scale, you know, it's hard to argue with what Jack said. Because of things like Spotify and social media, there's a gigantic wall of indifference to anybody that's trying to get hurt. At the same moment, it's easier to get heard, right? Anybody can put their music on social media or Spotify or Bandcamp or wherever you want to stick it. It's super easy, but because it's super easy, anyone and everyone can do it. So if anyone and everyone can do it, that means that the value 
has been decreased to nothing. That's why if they play a song of yours on Spotify, you get one ten thousandth of a penny for a play. Yeah. To make one penny, your song has to be played 10,000 times. Think about that. Yeah. Think that about is. that. If it takes me two years of my life to make a record like The Underworld Awaits Us All, but its value in the real world is one ten thousandth of a penny, that's basically worth less than nothing. Yeah. <laughs> that is Except nice. to the fan who appreciates it and who's willing to come to the show, buy a t-shirt, buy a CD. So there's still a connection. The relationship between the band and its fans is more important than ever. Okay. Okay. And one last, last, the last, the last questions is how was your experience of the last tour here in Latin America? Which country for you was, or oh, where was, or oh, where, or oh, where are the most, most, most animico, so I don't know who, which country do you, the always you like to play, to play here in Latin America, Peru, Chile, Colombia, who knows? They're all good. There are no bad Latin America shows. Um, I think uh, something about whatever's in the water, whatever's in the culture, in the hearts, minds, and souls of Latin Americans, it's something very metal. So if you love metal and you want to play shows for an audience that appreciates metal, Latin America is the place to be. I love playing shows in Latin America. It's very tiring though. It's very exhausting because you have to fly and play in the same day. Like you get up early in the morning, you get on an airplane, you fly to the next show, play the show, and try to grab one or two hours of sleep before you have to do the same thing the next day. Be at the airport at six or seven in the morning, ready to fly to the next Latin American country. And man, that shit's exhausting. Try doing that for two weeks. You'll lose your mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Carl, we come to the sad moments of this interview. I hope you enjoyed this interview as I did. And thank you very much for your time. This new album is a tremendous album for the band. I'm a fan, as I mentioned, I'm a fan, I'm a huge fan. I, I saw you three times live. So I hope the next time we'll arrive here and I will see you for the full time because I love the band. I have all albums in CD and two albums in vinyl. So and a lot of this year from your band. So maybe you have something to add to your Latin fans and obviously Metalerium followers. I hope to see you again very soon. Uh, I'm playing Latin America. Fuck yes. Mm -hmm.